Good afternoon, Eddie. Good afternoon, well, that's a pretty tame tie you have on today. School for the deaf colors. <laughs> Those are good colors. Uh, thank you for joining me for today's uh, daily COVID update uh, here in Arkansas. <clears throat> I'm glad to be joined by uh, Dr. Nate Smith, of course, Secretary of Health, but his colleague, uh, Dr. Jose Romero, uh, who will be uh, speaking a little bit later today as a pediatrician, mm -hmm. uh, epidemiologist on uh, children's issues. And then uh, we're also pleased to have uh, Stuart Walton, uh, our chairman of the Economic Recovery Task Force, uh, to give us an update as well. As you know, yesterday I was in uh, Washington, D.C., and I met with the president, but let me just remark on the city of Washington, D.C. for a moment, our nation's capital. Uh, I've never seen uh, the town so empty, uh, so quiet, uh, almost abandoned. Uh, the streets were empty, the retail shops were all closed, the restaurants were closed, uh, the hotels uh, had, uh, were almost empty. And uh, I look at that, and I had some conversations, and of course, uh, they've learned to work remotely. Uh, but those are those that are in the higher income categories. But it is the low income service workers are being so adversely impacted. And it just illustrates the fact that people are hurting out there, uh, particularly the low middle income, and we have to continue our efforts to uh, be in business, uh, to provide people the opportunity to make a living in a safe fashion and to deal with this. As a nation, we have to figure out how to reduce the spread of the virus and to live, educate, and make a living at the same time. And that leads me to uh, the report today on the cases. Uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Smith reported that we had 5,003 cases in Arkansas. Uh, today, uh, we have an additional 455 cases here in the state of Arkansas. This is the largest uh, single day increase in cases since we have been reporting. Uh, of those 455, uh, Dr. Smith will give the exact numbers in terms of those in the community and those in corrections, and we will look at that in a moment. And so today we have 5,458 cases with 86 hospitalized that represent an increase of seven and we have three additional deaths uh, that uh, give us a total of 110 deaths in the state of Arkansas. Over the last uh, 24 hours, we have tested 2,616, uh, which is a good number, not a record number, but it keeps us on pack, pack, uh, target of making our goal of uh, 60,000 tests during the month of May. The positivity rate is 4.4%. Uh, which, as you know, is well below uh, our, uh, the national standard of 10 percent or goal that has been set. Uh, let's go through the uh, charts today. And you can see uh, from day one, our largest increase was 300 previously in one day. Uh, we have now an increase of uh, 455 cases today. And you can see the breakdown from those in corrections, almost equally with those in the community. And before you go to the next slide, uh, whenever you look deeply in the community as to where these occurred, uh, some in Yale County, 33, that's probably associated with the uh, poultry industry uh, breakout there. We had 27 increase in Benton County, 26 in Washington County, and 19 in Union County. So you can see that they are scattered around the state. Uh, if you go to the next chart, this is a seven-day well, no, back the seven-day rolling average, and you can see that we are uh, going up because of this uh, enormous spike today. And yes, this is a concern to us. We're watching it very carefully. We know that it is reflective of the increased testing that we're doing, uh, but it's also something that we want to be able to get in and do our contract tracing, make sure that we understand uh, whether this represents a new outbreak somewhere or whether it is just a reflection of increased testing. If you go to the next uh, slide, this is a number of currently hospitalized. Uh, and here again, we're uh, way below our heights before, but we're watching that carefully. Uh, the next slide is the number of active cases. And here the uh, highest increase in active cases was at 
four, not increased, but the highest number of active cases was 1,400 and it looks like about uh, 25. And so we're approaching that uh, as a result of the increase we've had over the last 24 hours. And so that trend is clearly uh, a concern to us. Uh, the next slide is, uh, and here's the encouraging news in it, the reflective of the increased testing, and that is the percent, percent of COVID-19 positive tests by date of result. And of course, as we started out early on, uh, we were doing little testing, very targeted. It was way up 32% positive rating. It went down to 25% here. And 10% is what the CDC guideline says is what you really got to watch for. And for a, a long period of time, we've been below that. We had one, one day that was unique. I think we did some uh, testing probably in the correctional facilities. And even today, even though we had a great uh, higher number of cases, our positivity rate was below 5%. Those are encouraging numbers, uh, as well as the number of tests that we're doing. And then uh, the next uh, graphic, and this I want to point out, is, uh, was taken earlier today before the new cases are posted. And so this number does not reflect the new cases that are in the system. This is just a moment in time from the Department of Health website. And I want all our Kansans to understand how easy it is to access this information. And I encourage you to do it so that you can see not just the number that statewide, but you can look on each county where you live and see the number of active cases in your area. And this helps guide your behavior, uh, whether you feel comfortable in getting out, uh, what actions you should take. Everybody needs to be knowledgeable about what's happening in their area. Of course, the darker blue are the higher number of active cases. The lighter blue and white are uh, the lower number of active cases. And um, uh, let's see if I can find that. Uh, the depart you go to the Department of Health website, though, uh, departmentofhealth.com, and you can log on and see this, and we encourage you to do that to get the latest information on your particular county. Now, uh, let me come back and uh, make a couple of uh, announcements today. Uh, first of all, uh, the Crater of Diamond State Park, one of the most popular state park venues in Arkansas is now open. Uh, actually, it will be open tomorrow morning, May 22nd. And Secretary Stacy Hurst uh, asked this announcement to be made. Uh, this is clearly important to the economy of southwest Arkansas. It's a popular destination, and uh, we are delighted to have uh, that reopen with some restrictions, limited to 500 visitors per day. Tickets can be purchased online, and we encourage that. Physical spacing will be enforced during the course of the day, and tickets and more information can be obtained at ArkansasStateParks.com. And then we uh, indicated it was supposed to be yesterday, but I ask uh, for it to be announced today uh, because this is very important to me, uh, having uh, uh, family members, uh, grandchildren that's engaged in team sports. And so we want to go to uh, the announcement and some of the uh, rules that are in place and, and let me first uh, focus on the fact that uh, yes we want to have team sports and this pertains through K through 12 it does not pertain to intercollegiate sports which is a separate conversation this is our team sports at the high school and the community level and yes when it comes to baseball let's play ball this summer it's going to be a little bit different but we wanted to put the protocols in place so that our young people can't have that experience again in this type of what we would consider a non-contact team sport. Now let me go through this a little more specifically. Um, and this is effective June 1. So note that effective June 1. Ticket sales, if, we're, if there are ticket sales, the purchase, they should be online if possible. Team practice, competition prohibited for close contact supports like basketball, wrestling, football, volleyball, soccer, and martial arts. And uh, I visited with Dr. Smith. We said we will revisit uh, those guidelines and those sports June 30th. And so this is not a permanent statement in regard to those sports, but it is where we are right now. But even in those sports, they can have individual practice with their own equipment, conditioning, training, 
uh, can be used in accordance with the rules for gyms. Cheerleading and dance may practice under gym directive uh, restrictions. Uh, the practice, the competition is allowed for limited contact team sports like baseball, softball, track, gymnastics, and swimming. And of course, we'll have physical distancing whenever possible. We'll try to use your own equipment. Uh, and uh, if you're an older citizen or have health concerns, you should not be participating in those sports. If you go to the next uh, uh, part of the communication here, uh, this again is the team sports. Uh, distancing uh, should be required except during active sports activity. Obviously, when you're playing, you're not going to always be doing the distancing. The athletes, the coaches, and staff should be asked and screened. Uh, temperature checks for coaches and staff. Uh, face coverings for everyone 10 or older. Obviously, while they're competing and in competition, you remove, remove the mask and the face coverings. The coaches and staff, we would ask to wear at all times. Obviously, if there are some questions or we need to refine this, we can coordinate with the Department of Health. Uh, there are some areas of social distancing that can be applied there, but we want the coaches and the staff to set a good example for the young people so that they take uh, this, uh, the health risk uh, seriously as well. Uh, and so all the others, you can look on the directive itself for some specific guidelines. And then if you go to the uh, next one, I think there's one more slide on this. No, I think that's all. And so that covers uh, team sports. Uh, and I'm delighted that we can play some ball even under uh, uh, challenging circumstances and with some restrictions that we're not used to. But this allows us to get back with uh, activity. And we can revisit some of those contact sports uh, after June 30th or before. We will see where we are as a state uh, to address that. I know how this is important for our families, uh, our communities, and we got to make sure that we uh, take the proper safeguards. And then before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Smith, I did want to comment for a moment on our pandemic unemployment assistance program and the payments we're trying to get to our gig workers, our self-employed uh, individuals who've applied for assistance. Uh, the website uh, is secure. Uh, and the s website is operational as of yesterday morning. And at noon today, uh, as of noon today, over 15,000 claimants have been emailed that they can go on the site and file their weekly claims. As a result, uh, 5,854 claimants have entered their weekly claim, and almost 4,000, exactly 3,975, had the payments sent out last night and could be in the claimant's account either this evening or tomorrow morning. Another 1,879 claimants had requested debit cards, and they will be sent uh, their cards. It will be a little bit slower process because they're debit cards, but they will be sent out uh, as well. And I know people have been patient, but we indicated we were working very hard. And the team, I applaud them for working uh, overnight, extra hours through the weekends to get the uh, system secure, up and running, but also the weekly claims uh, approved so that the money can be checked. The banks have been very cooperative to accelerate the uh, deposits whenever they receive the uh, transfers. And so we're looking forward to those, uh, uh, those funds being in the claimant's account starting late today uh, or tomorrow morning. And of course, others will continue to file their weekly, weekly uh, claim uh, request. With that, uh, Dr. Smith, thanks for carrying the ball yesterday, and I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Governor. I'd like to start by talking about these uh, numbers a bit more. Uh, the 555 new cases are obviously quite alarming. It's almost 10 times as many as we had uh, in, a, in one of the lower days uh, this past week. Uh, I need to point out that slightly over half of those, 229, are from correctional facilities, and these are from the Federal Correctional Institute in Forest City. These were cases we, al we already knew about, uh, but they had not yet entered into our system because they were done at various labs through the testing efforts of the CDC and the Bureau of Corrections. So those 229 are not actually new cases. Uh, the 226 community cases are, of course, a concern. 
Uh, now this is, uh, I need to point out, as I have before, uh, this is not uh, a biological phenomena. We don't go from 80 to even 226 overnight because of new infections. Uh, COVID-19 spreads fast, but it doesn't spread that fast in a single day. This is a, a largely a matter of increased testing. Uh, we have dramatically increased our testing since last month. Uh, in the first three weeks of this month, we have tested almost as many as we tested in the entire months of March and April. Uh, not only have we increased our numbers, we've increased the scope of our testing. We're now testing not just those who are symptomatic, we're testing even those who are asymptomatic uh, but have contact or are living in an area of, of higher transmission. Uh, and uh, we've also made the testing more available uh, to people who otherwise may have limited access to testing. Since the beginning of this week, we've been doing, offering COVID-19 testing at 79 of our local health units uh, all throughout the state. And there are people who are now able to get access to testing who did not have access or did not have good access before. Uh, the second thing that I need to point out about this uh, 226 new community cases is that they're not all coming from one place. Uh, this is spread out in many different parts of the state. The governor mentioned that we had 33 cases in Yale County, 26 in Washington County. Well, we also had 27 in Benton County, 19 in Union County, 13 in Pulaski County, 13 in Pope County. 17 in Craighead County, and 17 in Crittenden County. So we've got cases from many parts of the state, uh, and these are cases uh, that uh, I think largely had been unrecognized. Uh, likely many of them are asymptomatic, um, and uh, this is a, definitely a concern, especially since we're seeing an uptick in our hospitalizations, but we need to uh, put this in in context and perspective, we will be gathering more in information on these cases and trying to identif identify patterns. Uh, where, what are the risk factors, the places where people may be getting, uh, getting infected so we can better understand and prevent the spread of COVID-19. I'm actually encouraged that we're actually identifying these cases now because then we can interrupt these chains of transmission. Uh, we can't interrupt those chains of transmission if we don't know about them. Uh, in terms of our response, we will be doing not only continuing to offer uh, daily testing Monday through Friday in our local health units throughout the state, but we'll be doing targeted testing uh, like we did um, this past weekend in Forest City uh, in, um, in all these counties that have higher numbers of cases. Specifically, May 23rd, we'll be uh, doing testing in Washington County. May 30th, we'll be de doing testing in Crittenden, Jefferson, and Sevier counties. June 6th, in Craighead, Pulaski, and Union counties. And then next week, we're going to be doing uh, testing in Yale County as well. And uh, in many of these cases, we're doing them in partnership with our community health centers. Our total uh, number of cases today is 5,000. 458 of those 1,433 are considered active cases. Of those active cases, uh, 543 are in correctional facilities, 94 are in nursing homes, and 796 are community cases. Uh, in terms of our nursing homes, we've only had two additional nursing home residents and two additional staff uh, in the last 24 hours test positive. So our totals there are 330 residents and 197 staff. For our correctional facilities, uh, we don't have any new cases. These new cases that were reported had already been tested last week at the uh, Federal Correctional Institute. Our current hospitalizations, as the governor mentioned, have increased by a net of seven to 86. We have currently 14 on a ventilator. That's a decrease of two from yesterday. As the governor mentioned, we've had three additional deaths for a total of 110. We have, uh, in terms of recovered, we have 3,915, and that's an increase of 63 uh, from, uh, from yesterday. Uh, as the governor had shown a screenshot of our new website that was launched yesterday, if you go on that, you can click on any county and you'll get the number of active cases. There's a lot of very useful information there. Uh, maybe at some point we'll show you a, a demo, but uh, the screenshot doesn't really capture the full functionality of this website. 
Uh, two uh, really quick uh, additional uh, comments. First of all, I'm red, wearing red because this morning I went and donated blood. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been a big concern with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, nationally is the decrease in blood donations. And it's created a critical situation for patients uh, who need blood, because people need blood every day for various things, whether it's trauma or other medical conditions. This is very personal for me because my mother-in-law was admitted to the hospital this past week and she required a blood transfusion. Uh, people are not going in and donating as often as they had been, maybe for fear of COVID-19 or maybe they're just distracted. But I want to remind people, if you're a regular donor, go and donate. And if you've not donated before, this is a good time because they really, they really need it. And it's very easy to do, uh, and they make it uh, uh, very safe, very comfortable. I was in and out and um, you know, got to sit back in a comfortable chair, watch a little TV, and then uh, get on with my day. Uh, the governor has mentioned the directive on team sports. Uh, the other directive that we're putting out today is the long-awaited one on overnight summer camps. These two directives are some of our most complex directives. A lot of work has gone into these, and they're some of our longest directives. So I'm not going to go through them point by point. I'm going to refer you to them. Uh, they are complicated because we know that COVID-19 is, is, is being uh, spread in many of our communities, most of our communities in the state at some level, and we want to make these activities as safe for children as possible. And that's the reason for uh, the detailed requirements in these directives is so that children can be involved in these without putting them at undue risk. Now, fortunately, children are less likely to get severe complications from COVID-19, but there are some very severe complications that can occur among children, and that's why I'm going to bring up uh, in just a moment here um, Dr. Jose Romero. Dr. Romero is the Chief of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at UAMS and Children's Hospital. He is also our Chief Medical Officer at the Arkansas Department of Health and also a nationally recognized leader as the Chair of the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. I'm going to have him come up and talk about one of the complications in children that has been recognized recently, this uh, multi-system or multi-organ inflammatory syndrome. And uh, Dr. Romero, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Governor, Dr. Smith. Um, so uh, I want to make uh, the public aware of a syndrome that was uh, described recently and uh, CDC notified physicians across the country and uh, our state about it. Um, it was originally uh, recognized in Europe. It's called multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome of children. Um, it's a severe inflammatory disease that follows the infection uh, with uh, COVID-19. Um, these children present with uh, a fever of uh, more than a day. They tend to have uh, significant inflammation in their body. And uh, most importantly, they have multiple organs in their body involved, which can include the brain, the heart, uh, the gastrointestinal system, liver, kidneys, and blood in infections. All these children that have been identified, or the vast majority of them, have had evidence of either a virus at the time that they present or uh, antibodies at the time that they're tested. Um, there have been approximately 200 cases reported so far, but the syndrome is relatively new, and so more will be uh, reported shortly, I'm certain. Um, there is treatment for this. It's the treatment that we use for a disease called Kawasaki's disease, which mimics it very, or this rather, mimics it very closely. Um, and uh, there have been deaths, but they are exceptionally rare. Um, uh, we want parents to be aware of this. Uh, to contact their physicians or their care providers so that guidance can be provided if their children have any of these symptoms. And I'll stop here and turn it over to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Romero. That's a good uh, uh, admonition and information for everyone. And now uh, Stuart Walton, who's done such a great job as chair of our Economic Recovery Task Force, I want him to give an update, and I want to thank him for helping to guide some of these uh, lifting of restrictions, uh, working with the industry groups, giving them a voice, and the coordination with the uh, Department of Health. Stuart. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here in Little Rock today. Um, I want to start by just saying how proud I am of the Arkansas businesses out there that have reopened and that are starting to serve customers again in ways that are uh, novel and new. Um, but it's not easy, and it's not uh, necessarily anything that any of us thought we'd be doing uh, here in May 2020, but it happens to be the reality we're with. And actually, uh, I went to a restaurant the other night. I've been to a couple now, and uh, it was a pleasant experience nonetheless, uh, and despite the masks. Um, I want to recognize uh, the governor. Um, really, I think I've heard from a number of different business leaders, and, and they've, they've continually praised uh, both the slowing down of closing up the state, but also the measured pace at which we're reopening. And, uh, and I think that's recognized across the state as, as a very prudent way to act and respond in this time. Um, but I've heard that on a number of different accounts, and I just want to share that there's a lot of folks out there that are really supportive of, of the approach that the state's taken. Um, the task force is actively following the data and the cases in Arkansas, and of course we're concerned with the uptick that you saw in the numbers today. Um, we uh, will be posting the guidelines on the Ready for Business Task Force website uh, by the end of the day that, that Dr. Smith and the governor have uh, spoken about. Um, and we uh, continue to keep those uh, guidelines updated. And, a couple different cases where we've had to uh, tweak some of the guidelines, for example, with respect to uh, pools, lap swimming, things like that, where they've been a kind of follow-on update. Um, we've been able to get that on the website as well. And so we just encourage people, whether you're a customer or a small business owner, any stakeholder in, in the state of Arkansas's businesses or institutions to go on there and check relatively regularly about uh, any uh, updates or regulations or guidelines that might be relevant to your business or activities. Um, we are in the process of producing an interim report, and uh, that's underway. We expect to have that to the governor uh, by next week, end of next week. And basically, it's going to be a, a summary of where, where we've been, uh, where we are, where we kind of see where we're at, and, and some next steps uh, for the task force. Um, we also intend to publish that on the website towards uh, the end of next week or, or after we're able to finish it up and give it to the governor. And again, that website is ArkansasReady.com. Um, finally, I just want to make a, a comment about an institution that's near and dear to my heart, uh, Crystal Bridges. I've uh, been in conversation with some of the leadership there, and they are uh, taking some very tentative and early steps to plan their reopening. It will be cautious. It will be slow, similar to the approach that I think the state has taken, but I'm really excited uh, that this institution will begin to welcome guests inside again on a limited basis, a resident basis, um, but I think that's an encouraging sign and just want to applaud the leadership there for working through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. And with that, we'll happy to turn it over for questions. Check. The uh, PUA website back up and running. Have we figured out what went wrong yet? Uh, I received a uh, briefing uh, uh, on that uh, right before coming in here uh, from our uh, forensic team and uh, those that are overseeing this. And uh, it's a uh, complicated process. The most important thing that they've concentrated on is making sure that the site is secure now in order to protect everyone's data. Uh, they have that confidence both internally but also the external reviewers and so that's why the website went live and concentrating of course on getting those uh, funds out. Uh, they're still reviewing it as to exactly what happened and what lessons that we can learn from that and so uh, that's both in the hands of our uh, forensic team as well as uh, the law enforcement team. So are we thinking this is more of a website flaw rather than well, I think those can be, uh, no, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Obviously, if you can break into it, uh, there's some flaw in the system. It's not perfectly protected. And so uh, that's not saying there's not any flaw in the system, and it's not saying uh, what the intent of whoever it was that accessed that. Uh, so I think that all remains to be seen. Uh, but the net result is uh, we have the system up and running, 
and it's processing, and it actually it's within the time frame, I believe, that they indicated we hope to get them out uh, the checks this week, and, and the money is flowing. Um, in terms of the increase from uh, the new increase in cases, uh, I know you're still looking into it, but um, are, do these seem to be associated with each other or a particular workplace or anything like that? I, my conversation uh, with the health team, it's a little bit early to know. Uh, they've got to look into it. And that's a lot of cases, by the way, to do con contact tracing on. <laughs> that's going to be an investment of manpower. Uh, but they'll be looking at that. I think the first look is simply that, uh, you know, it's broken down fairly even by counties. And in some counties, like we pointed out in Yale County, we know that there was a small cluster there, it could be associated with that, but we've got to do more work on that. Is that a poultry plant or in Yale County? Uh, this uh, was a, uh, a van of uh, workers that were traveling together is where that started. Dr. Smith, I want to make sure I'm accurate, so I'll let you address that. Yes, it's a poultry associated uh, uh, business that actually goes out and and vaccinates poultry. When can summer camps open and can you just give us a brief idea of what that will look like? Dr. Smith, why don't you... Uh... The effective date for overnight uh, camps, uh, let me get you the specific dates uh, on um, in our directive. Well, I'm going to I'm going to pull out my cheat sheet because this is a, a longer uh, directive. For summer residential camps, our start date is May 31st, and that's when um, uh, we're we're allowing the um, the uh, uh, counselors to come in. I believe a week before that, but it's uh, May 31st is the is the start date. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to refer you to the to the details of the of the directive because it's uh, rather long. Pardon? The directive is complete. It's complete. It will be posted by the by the end of the day. Uh, can you comment on the like newly released CDC guidelines for schools and where Arkansas is in terms of um, schools reopening in the fall? Yes, uh, we actually welcome uh, additional CDC guidance on that. Uh, those are, are uh, pretty lengthy and uh, give a lot of things to think about and consider. And uh, I will uh, uh, look forward to the opportunity to, to talk with uh, Secretary Key about um, uh, the principles in here. Um, I know that they, uh, we already have plans to open, uh, and hopefully we can incorporate as many of these uh, uh, guidance elements as possible into those plans. Did you have a question, Liz? Uh, but for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, can you clarify your position now on uh, mail-in ballots? Because in the paper, with your reporting of your meeting with the president, you seem to suggest that, you know, um, opening the polls early, you would support that. But I, I wasn't clear on what you think about mail-in ballots. Uh, what I uh, express support for is what uh, we uh, changed the rules to allow in our special elections, which was no excuse early voting. And we expanded the early voting site so that it was easier for people to vote earlier. Uh, in my view, that's a much safer uh, opportunity for those who are concerned uh, because you can spread it out, you can reduce the crowds and it's not, not all happening on Election Day. And so that's the first option that I would look at in the event there is still health concerns in the November election, and it's probably a little bit too early to know that. Uh, in terms of the uh, mail-in or uh, vote-by-mail scenario, uh, that's not the law in Arkansas, and uh, there's not uh, uh, broad support for that in my judgment in Arkansas. And we certainly haven't figured out the uh, security issues in regard to that. So 
Uh, that's why that's really not on the uh, front burner of considerations for me versus uh, the uh, no excuse early voting. Uh, I thought we did have no excuse absentee balloting during the special election and in the past you said that you would consider that as an option if the public health emergency was still going on in November. That's what I thought you said. Well, I think that's what I just said, isn't it? You're talking about early voting, but I'm talking about absentee voting. Uh, the absent, and I did say absentee yesterday, and I intended to refer to early voting. Now, uh, did I allow the no excuse absentee voting in the special elections? That's well, uh, we'll look at that. I have to review what we've done. Dr. Smith recommends that you go to absentee ballots. Is that something you would consider? I will always consider Dr. Smith's. Uh, distinguished opinion, so uh, we will certainly take that in consideration. Okay. Uh, this is more for Dr. Smith. Are, are there, in terms of uh, blood donations, is there a certain type that's in more need than others? I would need to refer you to the to the blood donation center and their website. Uh, um, uh, they took mine, and so uh, I'm not sure mine was the highest. But. And, and also, too, with uh, with contact tracing, uh, or, or do we have enough uh, considering this? fairly significant spike in, in kind of what we, we think we're going to see with more testing, we're going to see more cases. Uh, do we have enough and, and are they going to be able to stay on top of the situation? Our capacity for contact tracing has been growing. Um, not just adding new people but getting them trained to where they can do, work more efficiently and the data can, can flow more quickly. Um, this is going to stretch our team, and that's why uh, uh, last uh, yesterday uh, at the CARES Act Steering Committee, uh, I presented a plan uh, for dramatically scaling up our uh, our contact tracing, and uh, it was approved by that uh, by that committee. It will now go to the legislature uh, for uh, further review, but hopefully we can start working on that very quickly to enhance our ability. I'm, I'm very encouraged by what we've been able to do though. Um, we, we've, uh, <clears throat> we started out um, with 35 percent of our new cases not knowing where they came from and uh, in the most recent week we've got that down to 20 percent. So that means 80 percent of our new cases we know where they're coming from. Now the governor shared that he talked with Dr. Burks in Washington DC and she was bragging about Kansas because they were able to connect the dots for 50 percent of those in Kansas. So I feel pretty good about our 80 percent, but 80 percent is not enough. We really need to get that over 90 percent because if we don't know about chains of transmission, we can't interrupt them. But I'm encouraged that we're able to connect the dots for 80 percent at this point and with this new influx of cases uh, I'm confident our team will be able to do uh, the same. And that's the critical issue, is to find out where those uh, infections are coming from, what activities are associated with those. Um, when one thing follows another, there's a strong temptation to link them. You know, we opened up a lot of things and then we saw a lot of cases. Of course, we increased our testing at that time. But there are many states that have opened up and have not seen an increase in cases, so we need to look down and actually see what's happening. Are these cases that were associated with activities that have been going on from the beginning, or are these associated with newly opened activities? That's the critical questions we need to answer. So far, we've not seen that. Uh, let me go uh, remotely. Are there any questions remotely? Yeah, Governor, this is Andrew with AP. Uh, I want to ask you about the, 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 the spike, I guess, and I know Dr. Smith kind of touched on this some, why, why doesn't that, that number give you pause before, uh, you know, allowing summer camps to reopen, allowing youth, youth, youth sports to resume, uh, if there's still some, some uncertainty about that? And also I had a separate question on the, uh, the liability protections that uh, Senate Republicans have uh, have, have proposed, one, if you had a chance to look at that legislation and kind of work, if you're looking at an executive order or special session on that at this point? Uh, Andrew, uh, first, in, in terms of uh, our thinking uh, in opening up, 
We're very careful about phasing it in. We didn't all open up everything in Arkansas on May 4th. We didn't lift every restriction. We've been measured about uh, lifting those uh, restrictions uh, gradually so we can measure where we are. Uh, and so we're going to do a lot more studying on it. Uh, I've indicated that that certainly is a concern. We want to know more about it. But I also, you have to balance that with uh, my belief, as I've expressed, that uh, you know, we're not going to, we never did shelter in place. We're not going to go back to it. We're not going to uh, further shut down our economy. Uh, we're going to have to learn to manage uh, this uh, economy. And we're also going to have to stop the spread of the virus. And so you've got to do those two things simultaneously. And so life goes on. We have to educate. Uh, we have to make a living. We have to make sure people have an access uh, to a providing for their family. And so those are the steps that we're taking. And I think that's what the people of Arkansas expect. But we're very careful. If you look at these uh, uh, requirements, the public health requirements, uh, each of these activities, if those guidelines are followed, then we're going to be successful in uh, reducing the spread of the virus. The second part of your question in terms of uh, uh, the letter from the legislature, uh, one, I haven't seen a draft bill yet. I know that they're looking at uh, some comparable bills, but I want to see exactly the draft legislation that they're considering. Uh, secondly, I want to hear from the House. Uh, we've heard from the Senate, I'd like to hear from the House. Uh, to see uh, what their thinking is on that as well. Uh, next question remotely. Yes, hi. This is Scott from Channel 5 in Memphis. Um, St. Francis is seeing a higher rate of COVID-19 cases than some of the other counties. Any idea why St. Francis in particular is seeing such a high rate of COVID-19 cases? Well, uh, we're trying to figure that out. Obviously, you can first look at the uh, federal correctional uh, institute that's there that has uh, a number of staff that go from the uh, prison facility back to the community and so you know that's uh, a linkage that uh, we're watching. Uh, secondly you've had uh, two uh, uh, facilities there uh, in the St. Francis County that had uh, small breakouts in those particular facilities so you've had a combination of factors and uh, uh, that's why uh, Dr. Smith sent in uh, a massive team to do community testing, had 550 tests, and I think we learned from that that it is not widely spread in the community, uh, but uh, we want to be able to continue to keep an eye on it. Dr. Smith, do you have to add to that? Just a little bit more, Dr. Smith wanted to add. Yes, just as a reminder, we did 550 tests, 33 were positive. Uh, we're going to continue to test there. Uh, we offer testing there in our local health unit every day, Monday through Friday. All right, one more question remotely. Yeah, Governor, yeah. Governor yeah. Wilbur Everson from KWA News. Uh, I had a question about universities and colleges. I know a number of boards in the past couple of weeks have said that uh, they intend to reopen in some form or fashion for uh, in class learning on campuses. What needs to happen? colleges can responsibly reopen? Uh, well, we're working with them, and in terms of our colleges, uh, four-year and two-year institutions, I want them to open up. Uh, I want them to have as normal of a class structure as possible, uh, and to accomplish that, uh, we're working on increasing the testing capability and quick response within the uh, college ca campus atmosphere, so we know exactly what is going on there. Uh, and so uh, we expect to have uh, some proposals that's presented to the CARE Steering Committee as for some additional funding uh, for that infrastructure for higher education that will be a statewide approach. So uh, that's the uh, approach that we're taking. Obviously, anything that uh, higher education wants to do, we expect uh, Dr. Smith and his team to review it and reach uh, a good conclusion as to how we can uh, conduct education next year, and that is our expectation. I think there was a lady uh, on the line, a reporter, trying to ask a question remotely. Yes, Governor. Uh, this is Melissa Zigowitz with Channel 11. Uh, a restaurant in Benton recently had to reclose their dining room because people were coming in and refusing to wear a face mask. 
even when they were being offered at the door. Uh, what is your message to these Arkansans who are not wanting to wear them inside businesses, especially as Arkansas sees an increase in cases? Uh, thank you for the question. It's a very important question. I'm going to answer it and I'm going to ask Stuart to come up and comment on that as well. Uh, but I went into a, uh, a restaurant here for dine-in service. I had my mask on. All the waiters had their mask on. They were doing all following all the guidelines perfectly. When I finished dining, the uh, manager came up to me and said, can you make a request of the patrons to understand the requirement to wear a mask until uh, they're served? And because they had two of their wait staff cursed at by patrons because of the requirement to wear a mask. This is really unacceptable and it's embarrassing and, and people in Arkansas need to understand these businesses are doing what they need to do to protect their own health as well as uh, the patrons. And whenever somebody comes in without wearing a mask, it's not then about your health as much as it is about everybody else's health around. And so it's a very selfish act to say we're not going to abide by those guidelines that are meant to protect you and others. And so I hope that there's a lot of patience, but primarily it's your decision. If you don't want to go in there and dine, that's okay. That's your decision, but don't blame it on uh, the owner of the restaurant or the wait staff there. Stuart? Um, I think it's, um, I think I really couldn't say it much better than the governor, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's something that you do for other people. It's not something you do for yourself. And when you start to think about it in that light, um, it maybe brings a little different emotion to it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, the virus is real, it's, it's, and, it's, and it's really important that we continue to reduce cases and case numbers in the state. Because as people see these numbers grow, confidence is going to go the opposite direction. And wearing a, vi a mask or face covering uh, is just imperative in situations where it's impossible to socially distance. A restaurant happens to be one of those. Um, so I really would encourage uh, restaurant owners to be brave and just request folks that come in to wear a mask. And as a patron of a restaurant, please, please show up with a mask or borrow one if they have it. Thank you. All right, back to the table. How many days have we been doing an average of 2,000 tests per day? I wish I could answer that clearly, but Dr. Smith is going to be looking that up. Is that right? I'll give him a second on that. Let's do a, another question. We'll come back to that. How about that? Well, I got one for doctors. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, We do have a slide, but we just didn't, uh, didn't prepare it. Um, we have been doing um, uh, 2,000 or more tests a day since it um, uh, looks like the, the 12th of this month. And uh, of course, we had uh, over um, 4,000 uh, tests the day before yesterday and over, and, uh, over 3,000 the day before that. So uh, we've, uh, we've hit a, a, a new stride. Uh, one more question here. Um, I know you're just going to sort of, you know, refer us back to the, the directive, but is there anything that you can put out there for um, the number of athletes that can kind of train together or, you know, do they need to kind of be spread out? And then also, too, uh, are there any specific guidelines or recommendations that uh, you want to pass on to spectators of, of any of these? Yes. Um, I the short answer is it really depends on the setting. If, uh, if athletes are training in a, in a gym, uh, they're going to need to follow uh, the directives that we've already put out on, on gyms, and that's referenced in this new directive. If they're outside, certainly the number can be uh, quite a bit more, because you can, as long as you can spread people out. Uh, in terms of spectators, uh, they're going to have to follow the directives for large outdoor venues. Uh, so we've uh, not tried to recreate those. We've referred to those uh, when we can. So I plan on playing basketball this weekend uh, and working out with my two grandsons. We're all going to have our own individual balls. Uh, we're going to uh, 
uh, practice individually and we're not going to be playing five on five because that would violate the rules uh, through June 30th. Jay, if you want to come, we'll see if we can arrange something for you. Uh, is there another question remotely that has not asked yet? Governor, Governor, it's uh, Rosie Hoyt with THB 11. Um, I appreciate the message about playing sports, uh, but I'm wondering what's your message to parents on a day when you've released a lot of uh, disturbing numbers and talked about a disease that's affecting uh, children? What's your message to parents as they consider whether to send their kids to summer camp or to day camp, and how much are you planning to learn from the summer experience that will indicate what you'll do in the fall when schools come back? A great question, and the answer is that uh, just like we opened up our restaurants, but not every restaurant opened up. Uh, they want to wait a little bit longer, and so we're given a big freedom of choice here. And so there's going to be some parents that say, I don't think the time is right, or they might be uh, vulnerable health-wise themselves, so they're not going to send their children to participate in it. And I know that's difficult because there's a lot of peer pressure, but uh, those are individual decisions that people need to make. Our job is to provide information and guidelines that maximize the health uh, uh, opportunities and the resistance to the spread but individuals are still going to make their decisions. And even some uh, summer sports teams might say, uh, this is too restrictive, we don't want to operate in this fashion, and so they might not engage in it. A lot of people are going to make different decisions, even in the uh, day camp areas. Uh, they're going to look at the restrictions and the campings, and some are going to open up within those guidelines, and others are going to say, we're going to wait. Some parents will say, I'm not going to send my children to those camps. Others will say, uh, we feel comfortable in doing that. And as you know, when we started this on day one, I wanted to share the ups and downs of this pandemic with everybody in Arkansas. I think we have faithfully done that. Uh, and today, uh, we didn't hide the fact that we had the highest uh, case report that we've had. We share that information on the same day that we continue to uh, try to lift some of the restrictions. And we're trying to achieve that balance. We're trying to share information. I trust our Kansans with information are going to make good decisions. Some won't, but let's encourage them all and let's try to make individual good decisions. Is there any other questions uh, at the table? Is there any other question remotely? Well, maybe two quick, kind of quick questions. Um, maybe for Dr. Smith. Uh, Apple and Google have some kind of technology related to exposure, tracking. I was wondering if that's something we might use. And then also on the uh, multi-system inflammatory disease, have we had any cases of those? In our All right, Dr. Smith, or who's that, Dr. Merrill? All right, come on up, Dr. Merrill. So I can address the question about multi-system uh, inflammatory disease syndrome in children. Um, so we are actively looking for it. It's a reportable disease. It needs to be reported to the health department. Um, uh, my colleagues at, uh, at the Arkansas Children's Hospital uh, have not reported any, and I am asking uh, to be informed of any cases. So as of now, we've not had any cases. At the Arkansas Department of Health, we've been looking with keen interest at not just those apps, but other technologies for tracking movement, for uh, helping to uh, assist with contact tracing, et cetera. Um, and uh, we've got a team, an informatics working group uh, that is looking at these. Um, there's uh, potential positives to many of these, and then there are uh, some skeptics uh, as well. Uh, we're going to try and incorporate those technologies as we can, uh, hopefully not investing a lot of money in unproven uh, technologies, but many of these are, are free to us, and so we'll try and incorporate those and uh, gain experience with them. With that, uh, thank you all for enduring a very heavy agenda day with a lot of information. Uh, have a good afternoon.